right, well, uh, thanks, thanks for all for having me. Uh, it's my first time uh, here. Uh, my name is Chris Whale. I'm the Director of Education over at the Orpheum Children's Science Museum in town. Uh, before that, I was a high school teacher over at Centennial. Before that, I was a PhD student in neuroscience. Uh, before that, I taught high school in physics. And before that, I don't think I can really remember. Um, so I'm kind of a jack of all trades a little bit, master of none, studied some psychology here and there uh, and some physical science. Um, but uh, I, don't know, I thought it was a very interesting topic, uh, sparking creativity and also in particular kind of uh, the name. Uh, so I'm very fortunate to be at the Orpheum now, uh, I've been there about uh, five or six months and uh, we have a very exceptionally creative uh, database. We work with we work with a lot of volunteers. We work with a lot of U of I professors, a lot of students, a lot of Parkland volunteers, a lot of high school volunteers, about a, a lot of parents, a lot of businesses, and uh, we seem to be able to uh, generate on demand new and in innovative and creative kind of experiences. Uh, if you've come kind of to the winter event, uh, we had. For instance, uh, we transformed the theater and it was kind of a winter wonderland. You could do ice fishing uh, and you could actually sled down the theater, uh, which was very creative, very innovative. Uh, we have a March of the Penguins event coming up. Uh, we had a haunted house where it was really a haunted mystery where you kind of go through and try to solve uh, mysteries as far as where we get our fears from and, and this sort of thing. Uh, which then really kind of got me to thinking about what really is creativity and, and, and how do you foster it? Um, and I think even interesting, the, the third question asks about a creative space. Uh, but in thinking about that, it's really not a space at all. It's really much more of an environment. So in general, I think culturally, we have this idea, right? We always use the word spark with creativity, which tends to imply that it's something quite ephemeral, uh, right? A spark, it, it comes and it goes. And the idea is that Every now and then you're, you're traveling in your day and, and someone does something creative. And you say, oh wow, that's really creative. But you don't exactly know how to recreate the conditions to make that creativity. And more so how to create the conditions that it's not actually a spark, but actually ignites into some fire to produce something grander, right? So I kind of got to thinking, and I thought, well, you know what, really it seems like the focus tends to be on the spark. When in fact, if you look at what a spark is, right, it's very short-lived, uh, and it comes and goes, and it seems like it's very unlikely event for a single spark to emerge and set a fire. But really, when you're setting a fire, you're not really concerned with a spark, you're concerned with a family of sparks, right? And not only that, it, you can often produce a lot of sparks, but never actually set a fire anywhere. What's really important is also the immediate environment. So then I got to thinking, yeah, it's really not about the individual spark. One, it's about a cluster of sparks, and it's about the immediate vicinity. So what are the conditions that would actually foster such a fire to grow, to cultivate, and uh, to become kind of a tipping point experience where people change their outlook and their behaviors? And uh, kind of uh, being in the classroom for, for several years and just kind of experiencing uh, a lot of different ideas from physical scientists and social scientists, uh, it seems that there are a few commonalities. And one of them actually seems to be an environment like we have here tonight. One that you have to have a jovial environment. I've never found any real creativity ever coming about a very disciplined environment where no new opinions are thought of and are cultivated, right? So a jovial environment, one that produces laughter, one where everyone feels safe, they feel a sense of belonging, right? So they throw their spark out there, and the spark may go and it may fizzle, or someone else can add to that spark, right? So we need different types of people is also very important. You have to have individuals that think divergently, right? Kind of the artists, uh, if you will, some people that think convergently, uh, the engineers and, and some of the scientists, um, of course these are stereotypical, um, but you also have to have another important aspect in individual and that is a cohesion. So some reason to come together and to kind of set the stage 
for such an environment. The divergent individuals tend to throw something out there, whereas the convergent individuals tend to think about what's practical and what they know. And they tend to, they, sometimes they tend to dismiss the divergent thought, but in reality, that divergent thought plants a seed. It plants a seed that's outside what psychologists, educational psychologists would call the problem space. And it gets outside what psychologists call functional fixedness. That is, you always see a hammer based on what it's meant to originally do and not to do some new idea. And those are different diverging ideas, I think, give a way for the convergence thinkers to get outside their own domain and to think of something practical of how that idea could really work. But then, of course, none of this will actually happen without some sort of delivery system, okay? some sort of kind of teacher or direct catalyst that interacts, right? That's got to be able to transform this vision and an idea into something that's practical and earthly, something that's tangible, something that people will grab onto. Okay? And of course, you also have to have a large group that feels the, the desire to come out in motivation to change. Okay? And I think that's what we have here. Thank you.